our Ephesians study. Today is just going to be one verse, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And uh, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, that's all right where you're seated. The Apostle Paul is writing by the Holy Spirit to the church in Ephesus and says, verse 4, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Would you pray with me? And we'll ask God's blessing on our time together in his word. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you as our perfect Father in heaven and need for you at this time as only you can and as you always do to settle our hearts and enable us by the Holy Spirit to give you our undivided attention. And Lord, as we do, would you speak into our lives? Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. I want to talk to you today about the difficulty of parenting. And this is one of those teachings where I'm going to have to ask you to be patient with me. <laughs> I'm going to do my best to rightly divide God's word and unpack this big verse. And it is a big verse, which is why we're only taking one verse today. I think it's incumbent upon me before we jump into this to mention something that is very important at the onset, so much so that if you hear nothing else that I say today under the direction of the Holy Spirit, then you need to hear this. In and of ourselves, and by way of our own strength, skills, and ability, good parenting, godly parenting, is an utter impossibility. And it's for this reason that my sermon today, my teaching today, will not be riddled with parenting techniques, but instead point us to the wisdom of God's Word. And we have that here before us in this verse today. I hope you know that I'm in no way posturing myself as an expert in the area of parenting. I have made every mistake there is, <laughs> and my wife and I would be the first to admit that we have fallen short and even continue in this journey we call parenting, but one of the things that we're learning is that any success in parenting comes only because God extends his grace and his mercy, not only to us, but certainly even more so to our children. And by that I mean, God, for my wife and I personally, has not paid us as our parenting failures deserve and instead has been faithful when we were faithless. Oh, would to God that I could go back and do it over again. I guess there's just no do-overs in parenting, is there? As we get into our text, I think it's important that I provide an explanation and with it the application of what Paul is saying here in verse 4. One such explanation is concerning why Paul says that it's fathers that are not to exasperate their children. Why doesn't he say fathers and mothers? The answer is twofold. First, 
because culturally in the Middle East, and it's like that to this day, the father is the final authority in the home. And it would lend itself to this authoritarian harshness with children. Certainly that was my experience with my father growing up. Uh, he was very harsh with me, very hard on me, very disconnected from me. And uh, it caused uh, much in the way of what Paul is writing about here in our text today. A second reason that Paul says fathers is because the mother is naturally more nurturing and is less likely to exasperate children in this way. And this is really what the idea behind the word is, which we're going to talk about here in a moment. It's a, a nurturing them, training them, disciplining them in the ways of the Lord, the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Now, that's not to say that mothers don't exasperate their children, nor is it to say that fathers don't nurture their children. I think it would be a mistake to not see this exhortation in verse 4 of Ephesians 6 as applying to both fathers and mothers. I think we could uh, safely say that it could read parents. Don't exasperate your children. Another question that we need to answer by way of an explanation has to do with the translation of this verse, particularly as it relates to the word exasperating, or as some of your translations render it, provoking. Most translations render it provoking. Fathers, parents, don't provoke your children. But the word carries with it this idea of treating our children in such a way as to make them angry. And I like the translation of the word better as exasperate because it better explains, particularly for fathers, our propensity to irritate, frustrate, and infuriate our children. That's what Paul is saying here. And here's what happens. When we do that, it's only a matter of time before our children will become bitter and resentful towards us as their parents. It's interesting in Colossians, the Apostle Paul echoes Ephesians 6 concerning husbands and wives, husbands loving their wives, wives respecting their husbands, but he also echoes Ephesians concerning parenting. But it's a little bit different what he says to the Colossian church in chapter 3, verse 21. He says this, Fathers, do not embitter, embitter your children or they will become discouraged. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that we can embitter our children by placing unrealistic and even impossible expectations on them. Would you agree? Certainly our intentions may be good, but I think what happens is we do the right thing in the wrong way. And oftentimes it's because the parent is trying to relive their lives vicariously through the child. There are serious problems with this, clearly, chief of which is that we set our children up for failure because our way is not the way that God has wired them. I like how one commentator explained it. Wise is the father who understands that his children are not to be molded, but to be unfolded. In other words, you have the privilege, dad, of observing your child carefully, 
seeing how God made him, and then unfolding what God has built into him from the moment of conception, all for his glory. You know, it's interesting, and for those of us that have uh, more than one child, um, isn't it interesting how different they are? I mean, seriously. I, our firstborn son, I mean, they had terms like active alert. I don't like that uh, term because <laughs> active alert means you'll never sleep again because of the way that child is wired. And so when we had our uh, second son, Levi, uh, a year and a half, almost two years later, uh, he came out and, I mean, he was almost the polar opposite in his temperament than was our firstborn son. And I, I even remember, I mean, uh, when, when he, he smiled right out of the womb. And I was so stunned and taken back by that, I actually said to my wife, I think something's wrong with him. <laughs> He, he was such a happy, easygoing, mild, love. In fact, we call him Lovey Levi. He hates it when we call him that now because he's going to be 18. But we still do <laughs> in front of his friends. We love doing that. <laughs> but he's the opposite of his older brother who's very intense, focused, I don't know where he gets that from, but anyway. <laughs> and I mean, he, he's, he's so intense and so active. And, and he, was, he was walking by nine months of age. I mean, just, and, and they have, you know, you read all those books that say, man, if they're walking by nine months of age, whew, look out. Well, I only say that because these children that God has given us are wired very differently. And this is why we have this proverb, this, dare I say, famous proverb in Proverbs 22, verse 6. You know it. Train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You know, it's unfortunate that this proverb has been, for the most part, misunderstood and has led to much debate amongst Bible teachers. I've heard this taught in many different ways and... I've read all the books on this particular proverb, and there is this debate on two fronts, the first of which has to do with the meaning of the way he should go. And then secondly, what it means when it says the child will not depart from it when they're old. I would submit that the correct understanding of this proverb is that we are to train them in the admonition of the Lord according to their particular bent. What's really interesting about the original language is that it carries with it the idea of the midwife when a baby is born, they would clear the airway of that baby, that newborn. And so you, you take that and you transpose it to the understanding of this verse. And you can see it this way, that we're to create a way, train them up in the way that's conducive to their particular bent. And it's going to be different for this child than it is for that child. So... The promise is, and this is where we also get into some trouble with this proverb, is the promise is that if we do that, then they will continue in that way, in the ways of the Lord, 
when they're older and as they get older. That's the promise. That's the proverb. That's what it means. This is why the Amplified Bible parenthetically renders Proverbs 22, verse 6 this way. Train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's the promise. Now, let me hasten to add that this proverb does not mean we just let them do whatever their particular bent is. Rather, we are to train and disciple them. And I use the word disciple because it comes from the word discipline. To disciple, to discipline. And by the way, it's the same word in Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11, that's translated chastening in the sense of a corrective discipline. We're to correct and direct, to train, to disciple, to discipline them in the ways of the Lord. And we're to customize our training according to the child's bent, correcting and directing them in the ways of the Lord. And it's different for each child. What worked with one child is not going to work with the other child. I learned early on, and I'm still learning, and it's very interesting, the different learning styles that children have. This is why some children do not do well in your standard classroom environment. Uh, they're kinesthetic learners, and they have to always be moving and some are tactical learners. They, they, they learn by touch. And then you have visual learners. And I'll tell you, I mean, you have to discern and know and discover what that bent is and that learning ability is in your child. Because it will not only frustrate you to no end, it will frustrate them in the end if you try to train them in the way that they were never wired to be trained. I remember when my, uh, my firstborn son was uh, very young, he was a Cubbies in uh, Awanas. We had an Awana charter in the first church that I uh, planted and pastored on the mainland. And so when it came time to you know, take him to Awanas, uh, we would have to do the, the memory verse. And uh, we would practice, you know, throughout the week. And I would try to, you know, I, I, I'd say to him, uh, okay, now sit down and let's memorize this verse. And he would look at me with this look like, did you say I have to sit down? Yeah. Sit still so we can memorize this verse. All he could think about was, you mean I can't move? No, sit there and let's memorize this verse. Do you know that he never memorized a verse that way? <laughs> Do you want to know why he never memorized a verse that way? Because he's not wired that way. So <laughs> thank God for those who have done and gone before us as parents in this regard <laughs> and written books about this. But I discovered that he's not that kind of a learner. He's the kind of learner that needs to be jumping up and down on a trampoline, hanging from, you know, the ceiling, running around the yard, and he'll memorize every and any verse you ever give him to memorize. And we did that, and he did that. Okay, uh, Elias, why don't you just go ahead and uh, run back and forth, and uh, let's memorize. And even in our, uh, our family devotions... Yeah, you can't, this is where I think we get discouraged, uh, you know, with our uh, family altar time when our children are young and we have those, those family devotions. You got, you got one kid that's over here thinking to himself, I, I can't sit here. I, I need to be doing something. I need to be moving around. I need, you know, I need stimulation. I need activity. And you got the other child that says, I can't learn that way. Are you kidding me? I need to sit down here and I need to sit still and, and take this in. So how are you going to do that? 
we had to get really creative. And God gives you the grace for that. But our children are given to us with this particular bent. I, I tell you, uh, we, we have uh, three children. Of course, our daughter, who is now uh, 11. <laughs> and not only is there a difference between your children, there's a difference between boys and girls, right? So we're, we're learning. Pray for us because uh, we, we had to throw out all of our notes on bringing up boys now that we have this daughter who is in a completely different story. So um, I need to get through this teaching. So just hang in there with me. I, I need to do my best here. I think I'd be grossly remiss were I not to take the time to point something out here that's in the text, and it's this word instead. I want to draw your attention to this word instead. To me, this word not only provides the explanation, but it also provides the application, and I'll explain what I mean. Instead, of pressuring and pushing our children to please us, we're to be training and instructing them to be pleasing to the Lord. Here's what's sad. Many a parent harshly demands perfection from their children, which will only leave them feeling inadequate and then eventually leave them feeling very bitter and resentful. And here's why. The child will see their acceptance solely based upon their performance. So in other words, they won't feel loved for who they are. Instead, they'll become discouraged because they're never good enough. And, and by the way, our children want to please us, right? So here we are demanding from them that they dance to the beat of our drum, so to speak. And we do err greatly because oftentimes it comes at the expense of what God desires, and that's that they be pleasing to the Lord. How many children will say of their parents, you know, I just could never, it was just never good enough. I come home with B's, why don't you have A's? Come home with C's, why don't you have B's? This is never good enough. And so here's this child who is wired. God made them to want to please. They, they need from us as parents affection, attention, and admiration. And affirmation. They, they need to be affirmed. And this is where positive reinforcement comes in more, more so than negative reinforcement. Children respond more favorably to that positive direction and correction than they do when we come in from the other side and we just beat them down. And we're hard on them. And here again, we might have the best of intentions we do the right thing, but we do it in the wrong way because we want to push our children to be high achievers, right? You'll forgive the bluntness with which I say this, but maybe we need to revisit our definition of success. Where, where are the goalposts for your children? I mean, do you want them to be successful in life? Become, you know, have a 
high paying career, a prestigious title. Okay, nothing wrong with that. But let me ask you a question, and it's a question that I've had to ask myself, especially with a son going off to college. What is my definition of success? Here's what the definition of success is. Are they walking with the Lord? Are they walking with the Lord? That's success. That's success. Well, yeah, but I, I had higher expectations that they would become, you know, a doctor, a physician, a lawyer. I don't know why anybody wants anybody, but, but anyway, I'm sorry. If you're a lawyer, we love you. God bless you. Hey, listen, I can say that because I, I'm a car dealer. Okay, you can laugh now. That's fine. I had somebody uh, many years ago, uh, this is on the mainland, uh, long before I was in the ministry, uh, come up to me and say, how can you be a car dealer and a Christian at the same time? <laughs> yeah, so that's why I can say that about lawyers, okay? Uh, maybe you have these expectations for what you want your children to become, but isn't it Ultimately, that they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Is that not the definition of parenting success? At least as God defines it. I think we would do well to revisit and even examine ourselves to see if in our parenting we're like the rancher who drives a herd or the shepherd who leads a flock? Are we driving, pushing, exasperating, provoking, irritating, frustrating our children? Or are we leading them? Leading them in the ways of the Lord, discovering and discerning their particular bent and then training them accordingly in the ways of the Lord. Now, right about now you're looking at me going, okay, pastor, this is all great and everything, but my kids are older now and that ship has sailed. Well. I realize that, and I understand that, and I respect that, and I'm with you in that. Because in that sense, it is too late, and they're already on their own, and you've already kind of, you know, launched them, and maybe there's a myriad of emotions that come as a result, like discouragement and hopelessness, and here's the biggie, guilt. <laughs> and the feeling of guilt can set in because we buy into this notion that, man, I've totally blown it. Well, I want to encourage you because it's never too late. It's never too late. God is faithful. And it's never too late for our children, no matter their age. Never, ever, ever, ever give up on them. Even if they're the quintessential prodigal who's as far away from you as they are from the Lord. Let me just share with you, and I'll bring it in for a close, just from my own life personally. When it comes to a wayward son or a wayward daughter, there is no match for the power of a praying parent. I know that might sound, I don't know, 
cliche, canned, oh, there's power in prayer. No, 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 no. I'm standing before you today as a parent who has prayed for my children, and I'm standing before you today bearing witness to the power of a praying parent. Prayer and fasting, that wayward son, that wayward daughter is no match for the power of a praying parent. One more thing. I'm not angry. I know you're... you're <laughs> maybe, maybe Ephesians 6, 4 should read, you know, pastors don't, you know, exasperate your congregation. <laughs> if I've done that, forgive me. I don't know if it's possible to overstate this. And again, I'm just sharing from my own life, personally, my own experience as a father. First and foremost, by the way. And why I say that is because I'm a father first and a pastor second. I hope you understand that. I know I've shared this before. Maybe I need to share it again in the context of this uh, teaching. But this church can find another pastor. My children cannot find another me. In concert with praying for our children, we have to be unconditionally loving our children. Again, I don't know if it's possible. In fact, it's not very possible to overstate this. But one of the things that I am learning is that I need to love my children no matter what. I don't know if you know this or not, but we get, you know, a lot of prayer requests from people all over the world from our online church. And I'll tell you, it's pretty heartbreaking because every so often there's a parent that is pleading with us to pray for them because their daughter, their son has just told them that uh, they are, uh, they have a same sex attraction and are entering into that lifestyle or already in that lifestyle. How are you going to respond to that? How are you going to respond to that? No, seriously. I'm going to put a verse up on the screen, and I would really actually encourage you to uh, write it down or even turn there in your Bible. It's the second part of Romans chapter 2, verse 4. And this is a verse that God has used in my life in a powerful way in my parenting. The Apostle Paul says that it's the goodness of God that leads one to repentance. It's the kindness of God, the grace of God, the love of God that leads one to repentance. It's when there's that unconditional love where you say to your child, you know, I love you so much, more than anything. And we're gonna get through this. I will never shut the door on you I will never shut down on you. I will never abandon you. I will always be there for you. I will always love you. Doesn't mean that you, loving them is not synonymous with accepting their sinful behavior. And I think that's where parents get tripped up. Certainly there is such a thing as tough love but I think that sometimes the emphasis is on the tough and not the love. You'll melt your child's heart with the love that you have in your heart for them. That's the way God wired them. Love them 
and pray for them. And that's how I want to close. And again, I know it sounds like a firm grasp of the obvious. But I want to say to you that if you will pray for your children fervently and love your children unconditionally, you'll see the goodness of the Lord and the grace of God in their lives. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word and kind of tough stuff today, but good stuff. Lord, I pray especially for any parent that's here today or even watching online whose heart is just so broken. They're so overwhelmed. They're so discouraged. Lord, I just pray that as only you can, you would strengthen and encourage and bless us as parents in this awesome privilege that is ours with these children that you've gifted to us. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.